Hey, amazing AP Bio 2 kids. It's Ms. Lynam ready for a lecture on prokaryotic organisms. So if you get your notes out and turn to the slide, I believe it's slide 37, we're going to rock and roll with some stuff about prokaryotes. All right, so the first slide we want to go over is archaebacteria. Archaebacteria, remember, are in domain archaea. And they include examples such as methanogens, thermoacidophiles, and halophiles. If you look at the names, it kind of makes sense that they would be found in archaic or harsh environments. And um, like I said, this is domain archaea and kingdom archaebacteria. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on archaeobacteria. We're focusing in this unit mostly on the eubacteria. But I did want to mention this TAC polymerase. It's TAC poly is what I like to call it. We're going to be using this in the spring semester whenever we do genetic engineering. TAC polymerase is an amazing heat resistant, heat resistant restriction enzyme. Restriction enzyme. And if you remember, we mentioned restriction enzymes last week in class, which were produced by bacteria as a defense mechanism when they were being attacked by viruses. And so this one is of particular interest to humans, uh, to scientists, because it is heat resistant. And that means we can use it in a procedure where we want to amplify, amplify or copy DNA. So this would be pr particularly interesting um, or helpful when we had, let's say, blood at a crime scene and we only had a small amount of DNA and we needed to amplify or copy it so we could have a larger sample to test. Then we would be able to use this TAC DNA polymerase, this enzyme, in the process of copying and making a lot of DNA. And because it's re heat resistant, um, the process of doing this, you have to heat the, the um, supply up to a high temperature and this enzyme would be able to retain its properties even with this, um, the heat that's applied to the sample. So this is an example of an uh, application of TAC DNA polymerase would be a helpful archaeobacteria to humans. Okay, now one thing I did want to mention, remember that all archaeobacteria have a cell wall, but that cell wall lacks peptidoglycan, okay, lacks peptidoglycan. Um, and as far as what would you find in a bacteria, remember they're all prokaryotic, which would mean no true nucleus, no membrane-bound organelles, but they definitely do have DNA, and they do have cytoplasm, cell membrane, and like I said, the cell wall. So those are some things to remember about archaeobacteria, and they're found in harsh environments. Um, as far as their nutrition, one thing that you might want to note on here, the nutrition, most of these are heterotrophic, but there are some that are autotrophic, okay, but I wanted to mention underneath the autotrophic, some are chemoautotrophs, which would mean using inorganic compounds such as sulfur that might be in the, the hydrothermal vents in the deep sea floor. Um, some are also photosynthetic. So we do have some autotrophic archaeobacteria, but most of them fall within that heterotrophic realm. Okay? All right, here's where we're going to do most of our focus. My favorite section is the eubacteria. We started this in class, but I want to make sure that you have adequate notes because we do have a test next week. Um, so when we look at these eubacteria, these belong in domain bacteria. And they are definitely bacteria. So once again, we're dealing with prokaryotic organisms, okay, prokaryotes. And that means no true nucleus, no membrane-bound organelles. And just like I said with the archaeobacteria, they are going to have DNA, okay, so we'll have DNA, cytoplasm, cell membrane, cell wall, and don't forget those ribosomes. Remember, ribosomes are the only non-membrane-bound organelle that you will find in all bacteria. Okay, the archaeobacteria have those as well. I didn't mention it on the slide before, but they're going to be found in bacteria as well. Um, so when we go back over here, we talk about these are the bacteria that are true. EU means true. These are the bacteria that are ubiquitous, found everywhere. Um, we have these on our bodies, in our bodies, uh, on you know, the surroundings that we live in, on your cell phone, on your key keyboard, on your computer. They are literally found everywhere, and most of these bacteria are harmless. But of course, it's more interesting to talk about the ones that are pathogenic or disease-causing. But most of them uh, are definitely harmless. We can classify these eubacteria according to shape, 
and according to the gram stain reaction. And we've looked at both of these in our class by doing our microbiology lab. But the coccus shape, cocci or coccus, is spherical, okay, or round, such as this picture right here. The bacilli is rod shaped, which would be like this picture over here. And the spirilla would be spiral or spirochetti shaped, which would be this picture over here. So those are the three shapes that you could classify. Now, you could also look at a case like this one, where it's going through binary fission. It could be hard to identify, but this is one bacteria here and one bacteria here. But they can appear in chains. And if they ch appear in chains, we would call this strepto. They might appear in clusters. And if they're in clusters, that would be staph. You've heard of that one before, like staph low. Um, or they might even appear in groups of two, which would be diplo. So you're going to see um, the shapes that might be streptococcus, streptobacillus, streptospirilla. It could be staphylococcus, staphylobacillus, or staphylospirilla, or maybe diplo. So you could use these prefixes and put them on the shape, and that would describe what you're seeing when you're looking under the microscope. Okay, for gram stain reaction, uh, we just completed our, our microbiology lab. You guys were gram staining in class, so I hope you had fun with that. Um, but gram positive would stain purple, stain purple whenever you ran the gram stain procedure, and gram negative would appear that reddish or pink color, and that's all due to the composition of the cell wall, which I'm going to show you on the next page. But both of these have to do with the cell wall, okay, or having an extra lipopolysaccharide membrane. And like I said, I'm going to show you on the next page. But the additional factor that I wanted you to consider is whether or not they are treated and work well with antibiotics. Okay, so the one that works well, or res I like to say responds well to antibiotics are the gram positives. Gram negative tend to not respond well. Okay, they tend to not respond well. Um, although there's been a lot of uh, development in, in antibiotics, uh, before we could not treat a gram-negative bacteria with penicillin or an enzyme called lysozyme. But now there's a new group of antibiotics that are called ampicillins, ampicillin, and this one tends to work really well on treating some of these gram-negative uh, bacterial infections. So if it's gram-positive, a typical penicillin-based antibiotic would work well, you know, not a problem getting rid of it. Gram-negative, you have a little bit of a harder time, but we have been developing some antibiotics that are uh, working on these gram-negatives. And like I said, those are ampicillin, um, or they've also taken lysozyme and added some EDTA to it, and that works as well. Okay, so next slide you can see the, um, the physio physiological um, makeup of the cell wall in both of these. This is a gram-positive bacteria. This is the cell wall. Okay, you can see it's thick, extends from here to here. So whenever you gram stain, that gram stain, the crystal violet, goes to that and stains that um, all the way through, and that's the peptidoglycan. So that's the part protein, that's the peptido, part protein and part sugar, that's the glycan. So the crystal violet stain stains that, and it appears purple whenever you look at it under the microscope. The gram negative, this is the cell wall right in here. Okay, I'll change to my yellow color so you can see. This is the cell wall, so it's still there. Um, you see the cell membrane is the bluer. I'll use red for that one. This is the cell membrane right here. This is the cell membrane and this one. But then you end up seeing this one as an extra layer around the outside. This picture calls it a periplasmic membrane. It's really a lipopolysaccharide, lipopolysaccharide membrane. And what that does is give it some extra protection. Okay? It prevents that antibiotic from going in and breaking up the cell wall, because most antibiotics work by breaking up the cell wall. So if this one was treated with an antibiotic, the antibiotic breaks up the cross links between the peptides and sugars, and then, of course, water would enter in, in, from your body and blow up this little bacteria, so that's a way of treating it. Um, this lipopolysaccharide membrane doesn't allow the antibiotic to reach that cell wall to break it down, but it also um, prevents, like if you had a white blood cell that was a phagocytic white blood cell, um, can't even spell, phagocytic white blood cell, and it was going to attack this, that lipopolysaccharide membrane prevents it from being attacked by phagocytosis. So that's another thing about um, that, that cell, that extra lipopolysaccharide membrane. Okay, here's a picture that I might show you. I showed you a few of these in class. Um, these are gram positive. You can see the purple color. 
And you could also classify the one on the right as being strepto because they're in chains. And then bacillus, um, excuse me, coccus because of this, the circle. Here's a perfect chain right in here. You can see a chain of about four of these together, and they are round or spherical, so that would be streptococcus. Now, the second word, pneumoniae, that is the specific species name because you could have streptococcus pyrogenes. You could have other types of species that fit into this genus name. So that's the genus, and then there's the species. So that's a good picture of gram positives. Here are a few gram negatives. The one on the left is Nesseria gonorrhea A. Okay, they are also caucus. The one on the right is bacillus shaped, which gives you that rod-like appearance, and I'm sure you've heard of E. coli. Now, E is the genus name, it's Escheria. Coli is the species, and you can see the little rods. There's one right there. Okay, you can see individual rods, so that gives it the bacillus shape. Okay, so that's gram positive, gram negative. You can also see the pink appearance here versus the purple appearance there. So gram positive purple, gram negative, that pinkish color. All right, let's go ahead and talk about uh, bacteria and how they divide. So bacteria have a nucleoid region, not a true nucleus. This is a region, and I'm going to point to it right here, inside the bacteria where you will find one single circular chromosome. They have one single circular chromosome that is found in that nucleoid region. Not a true nucleus because it's not bound by a nuclear envelope, but it is an area in the middle of the cell where their genetic material um, is found. And like I said, one single circular chromosome, so that is a double-stranded DNA like what we have. Okay. Next we have, they have these things called plasmids, and then also we're going to go through um, binary fission. I wanted to get my screen so I could have all three of those here so I can write on it. So if we look now, let me tell you a little bit about a plasmid. This is super important when it, when, uh, it comes to antibiotic resistance in bacteria. So a plasmid is a small piece, okay, go ahead and copy this down, a small piece of DNA that is separate from their chromosome. Small piece of DNA separate from their chromosome. Most importantly, it can replicate independently, or can replicate independently. That means they have the capability of taking a plasmid, replicating it without replicating their one chromosome that they have. And you might say, well, why would they do this? This is really cool for them, not so much for us, but let's say there was a bacteria right here that had in its genetic material the resistance, it already had resistance to an antibiotic. Well, if it was able to take a plasmid, and I'll make that in a different color, which is over here, it's a piece of DNA, and it was able to have a gene on that plasmid that coded for resistance to that antibiotic, it could possibly copy that, make, make a copy, and pass it to another bacteria that's over here. And we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. It's actually a process of, of sexual reproduction called conjugation. But it has to do with the fact that they have these plasmids, small pieces of DNA, separate from where their chromosome is, that if they replicate it and it codes for something beneficial, they could pass it to another bacteria and, and it causes genetic variation. Okay, not only could it code for resistance to antibiotics, it might code for better metabolism. Okay, what if an advantage for a bacteria was to be a better metabolizer? And so if it had this better metabolism, then it might be able to pass that plasmid copy over to another bacteria. And so bacteria have this ability to exchange genetic, de genetic material with each other, which leads to like genetic variation. It's sexual reproduction. So that's kind of cool with, the, with this plasmid idea. So they have this nucleoid region area in there where you'll find their one single circular chromosome. But then they might also have these plasmid pieces inside their, their cytoplasm that they could exchange or give a copy once they copied it to another bacteria. So that's kind of cool. Okay, the rest of this slide, what I'd like to focus on is not the sexual. We're going to look at asexual reproduction. So remember, this means reproduction without the exchange, without the exchange of genetic information. Okay, without the exchange of genetic info. So what you see in this picture is called binary fission. That's the asexual reproduction process that bacteria go through. It's a very quick method of just simply making more copies of themselves. 
So if you start off right here in the first picture, and I kind of like to make a joke of this, and I say this is Bob the bacteria. Why am I calling him Bob? Because he's an organism. He's an independent organism. So here's Bob. Okay, you see his dark, kind of gray, one chromosome that he has. And when he goes through binary fission, all he has to do is double that so he replicates it. You can see it in picture two. There it is. There's two of them. Now, you see this little piece that's attaching right here to the cell membrane? That's to ensure that this chromosome is going to go to this side and this chromosome is going to go to this side so that it's going to have a little attachment site, almost like Velcro, where it's going to attach to the cell membrane to make sure as we go further through this binary fission process and the cell starts to split right here, that one chromosome is going to end up in this cell and one in this one. So going back to picture one, the one chromosome is doubled. There's its double right here. The cell grows. There's a little bit of growth right here, so it's going to grow twice as big. Okay, that means it's going to have to have more ribosomes. There are ribosomes in this picture, ribosomes in here, ribosomes, ribosomes. So it's going to have to make more ribosomes, double the cytoplasm, okay, that's cell gel and all the ribosomes, go twice its original size, and then it will start pinching in. Now, that pinching in is called cytokinesis. You probably remember that from freshman year. Division of the cytoplasm. That is common among them and among us, okay, but they're not going to be able to pinch so easily because of the fact that they have the cell wall. So it's going to have to be like pulled upon, kind of tough in here. New cell wall is formed between them, and then eventually you have two new cells. And this is now a bob. And this is a Bob, and Bob and Bob are genetically identical to each other, so they're exactly the same, but we get two whole new organisms. So now we have kind of Bob 1 and Bob 2 that are genetically identical to each other. So this is called binary fission. It's extremely fast. Um, it's a way for bacteria to make more of their own kind, and like I said, is that it is asexual because there is no exchange of genetic material. Okay, good. All right, next slide, we're going to talk about some adaptations. This, this is the coolest part. You're going to love this. So we're going to talk about some adaptations in bacteria, and you can kind of see in this picture what we're going to talk about. These little things sticking out are so cool. Plus down here you see this little thing right there that looks like a spoon. So we're going to talk about some really cool adaptations in some bacteria. Okay, some bacteria have what is called a capsule. This is outside of their cell wall. Okay, we are still talking about U bacteria, so that's outside their cell wall of peptidoglycan. Some bacteria have this extra layer, okay, this extra capsule layer. It is sticky, okay, nasty sticky. If you think like a slug has that sticky layer that they secrete on the outside, this capsule is a really sticky substance that helps them adhere, which means stick to a surface. Okay, well, what kind of surface might, what might we be talking about? What if they were sticking to the inside of your intestines? Not so fun, is it? Because they might have the ability to stick to your intestines and then stay there, and maybe even what if they had a toxin that they could release in your intestine, and then you got really sick. So not cool for us, but cool for them, especially if they're heterotrophic, and that's how they're eating. Okay, it is also a protective mechanism and it protects them, let's say, from your immune system. Because what if this capsule did not allow your antibodies to get in and break it down? Not so good, right? So these capsules tend to be associated with virulence, um, which means also with toxin production and making you sick. A perfect example is E. coli 0157, the pathogenic E. coli. Um, it is capsulated, has a capsule on the outside, and if you eat undercooked meat and it has E. coli 0157, it's tainted with that, this bad boy would stick to your intestines. It would be protected from your immune system antibodies, and it would start to also release toxins into your bloodstream that would not be very pleasant for you. So um, it's a way for them to be adapted to certain situations. Okay, so not good for you, but good for them. All right, the next adaptation are these things called pili, and I will point to one. Here is a pilus right there. It's a hair-like projection, not to be confused with cilia. Cilia are not found in bacteria. A cilia would, might be found in a protist, which is a eukaryotic organism. So these are different. They're hair-like projections that are used for sexual reproduction whenever they want to exchange um, a plasmid. 
So I spoke a, slide, a couple slides over about plasmids. This is when they would be utilized. Uh, the name of the sexual reproduction process is called conjugation. So what you would have is, let's say this is a bacteria right here, and he has, there's his DNA, and a plasmid is out here. Another bacteria, okay, let me draw this one in blue, is right here, would come up next to him. He would have pili as well. The pili would touch the pili of this one. They would form what's known as a conjugation tube, and then this plasmid could go through the conjugation tube over to this one, where this one has its DNA, and the plasmid could be uptaken by this one, and now this bacteria has the resistance to what this plasmid codes for. If it's the resistance to being treated by an antibiotic, now this bacteria would have that resistance because it engaged in conjugation, which is sexual reproduction, where one plasmid get, goes from one bacteria to another one. Now, remember, it copied it, so it's not like they lose their plasmid. They make a copy of it independently of their chromosome, so it's a copy of a plasmid that gets passed through this conjugation tube to the other bacteria. So it's pili to pili forming that conjugation tube, um, and that's one of the benefits which creates, like I said, genetic variation. Okay, that's an adaptation in some bacteria that have the ability to do that. Isn't that cool? Okay, another adaptation is this thing called endospore formation. And you can see it because that's what this little round circle is that looks like a spoon at the ends of these bacteria. That's an endospore. Best way for me to describe it is it's kind of like a seed that's protecting an embryo for a plant. So what's inside of that little bubble that you see right there is the copy of their DNA plus cytoplasm. So there's DNA plus cytoplasm in this endospore, and it's lying, um, I like to say dormant. It's protecting this bacteria, so it goes into what we call bacterial hibernation for a period of time. Um, what's really scary with this is that endospore is heat resistant, okay, heat resistant. So in other words, if you ingested, you ate something that had an endospore on it, even though you might cook your food up to a high temperature, if it was an endospore formation, you might not destroy that bacteria because this endospore is heat resistant. That wouldn't be good for you. Uh, they are also drought resistant, which means they can stay um, for a long period of time without being moist. There's not the necessity for them to have water because they're, they're resistant to, to drought. Um, it is also, what's really interesting is the endospore itself, we've looked at them. Um, scientists have done a lot of study about, well, what is this endospore made up of? And what they've discovered is it's a really, really thick wall of peptidoglycan that forms around the DNA and forms around that cytoplasm and keeps it in a dormant state for a period of time. There have been some of these, y'all, that have been dormant for like 10, 20 years, and then all of a sudden they break open their endospore when conditions are right, and then they start to then go through maybe uh, binary fission, asexual reproduction, and, and they start to divide. Um, one example that you may have heard of in this, I'm sure you have, is Clostridium botulinum. And I love that one because it sounds like my last name, Linum, right? But it's Clostridium botu, B-O-T-U-L-I-N-U-M. So it's not spelled like my last name, but it's Clostridium botulinum. And it is one that causes food poisoning. Um, not fun. There have been cases in the past where uh, there has been Clostridium botulinum in canned goods. This was like something that happened back in the 70s and 80s where there was uh, canned vegetables and some of the vegetables ha in the can, there was uh, Clostridium botulinum and endospore formation in the can and even though the can was pressurized, the bacteria still survived because it was an endospore formation and then we as consumers opened up the can, they broke out of their endospore and it caused a bacterial infection known as botulism. Botulism is the disease um, where that bacteria comes out of its endospore and makes you really sick. It's food poisoning. Um, another one that you may have heard also that has been in the news before is Bacillus anthracis. Okay, listen to that name, B-I-C-I-L-L-U-S, Bacillus anthracis causes anthrax. I'm sure you've heard of anthrax. That is one that um, was a bioterroristic threat uh, back in the 90s 
where there were some cases of envelopes containing white powder that were delivered to um, government officials. And that's because Bacillus anthracis is in uh, powder form, or they put it in powder form and put it in an envelope and send it to, sent it to people. But it, once it becomes airborne, if you ingest it, it goes to the lungs um, and causes uh, you know, upper respiratory symptoms. But it's also one that is in that endospore formation. Okay, not fun, but that is a, a bacterial adaptation. Okay, the last one, which you can hardly see down here because I've covered it up with all my notes, is some bacteria have an adaptation of motility. Um, and I'm sure you're familiar with the flagella. So bacteria can be multi-flagellated. They might have one, they might have two, they might have three or four flagella. But some bacteria also can glide on a layer of slime. So they can secrete a slimy substance. Don't confuse it with a capsule. Um, this is just a slimy substance that they secrete, and then they can glide on that. So those are a couple of interesting facts for you. All right, next slide. Oh, I forgot I was going to show you a couple of these examples. Duh, I forgot I had these in the notes. Um, these are a few good pictures where you can see uh, the spore formation. Look at this. That is where you would find the DNA and a little bit of cytoplasm. So that's the protecting of the genetic material. So these are all endospores. Look at these. All of these are endospores. Same thing over here where you see the white areas. Those are all endospore formation. Okay, crazy, huh? All right, so let's talk um, about another adaptation that is really, it's new. It's relatively new. It hasn't been around for a long time. Um, it's called biofilms, also known as quorum sensing. Okay, this is um, kind of amazing where scientists have even questioned, you know, should we be looking at these bacteria acting as multicellular organisms? Uh, the true answer is no. We're not considering bacteria multicellular right now. They are all unicellular. But they have this ability, this adaptation, to do what is called quorum sensing or creating a biofilm. Um, fairly recent discovery, but it's where bacteria get really, really close together. So there's a ton of them that all get really, really close, and they form sheets. And they are capable of exchanging chemical communication signals with each other. So this one can send a chemical signal to this one, and then that signals to this one, this one signals to this one. So instead of acting as an independent bacteria, they all are acting together. And it's based on this chemical communication that they're doing with each other. So researchers have been particularly interested in what these chemicals are. And so they're looking at to see, you know, like what is the basis of the chemical and how are they capable of communicating with each other and releasing that um, because they have done some, some amazing things and created um, almost what they call bacterial communities, which is kind of pushing the limits because you know, typically uh, you, you don't consider them as communicating necessarily with each other in these big sheets. So they're called bacterial communities, and they form in layers of sediment. This is where we found them before, in sediment layers. And they can be a meter or more in diameter. And whenever the bacterial cells bind to a surface, like if this was your surface, and they bind to the surface, they secrete a sticky gel-like poly polysaccharide matrix that tends to trap other cells within that. So they could all act together. If there were cells over here, they could secrete their polysaccharide, trap them within that, you know, and then heterotrophically consume these, which is not necessarily a great thing. Um, I'll tell you, in one case with humans, they have seen that biofilms are really hard to treat with antibiotics. Um, one place that they've found them for in, among people is in contact lenses. It's kind of scary, but in contact lenses, which I wear, and I'm sure a lot of you wear them, uh, they found that some of these bacteria form this, this layer across your contact lens. It's a bacterial infection, and it can like, cause an infection into your eye. So it takes those cells that are on the cornea, traps them in, causes a bacterial infection in your eye, which is painful, and then you have to go have antibiotics um, to treat it. Uh, one other example that has been noted has been in joint replacement surgery. Some people who have an artificial joint, like a knee replacement or a hip replacement surgery, they've had trouble with bacteria forming a biofilm around that joint and literally like eating at the cells that are in that knee joint. So it's kind of a, it's scary, but it's a new discovery that we're, we're learning about. But like I said, this diagram is what scientists are perplexed with because they're trying to see the communication between them. And that, that's, like I said, that quorum sensing or biofilms. Okay, next part, um, hang in there, we're doing amazing. Uh, the next part that I want to talk about is ways that bacteria can reproduce sexually. OK, 
Okay, this is sexual reproduction. So all of these methods, here, here, and here, would all be means of genetic recombination. This would mean like variety, varying the genes among bacteria. So one of those processes is called transformation, one is called transduction, and one is called conjugation. This is the one I was just talking about about uh, five or ten minutes ago, conjugation. This is when bacteria use those pili and they exchange a plasmid. And this is what you see in this picture right over here. Okay, I'll draw my little yellow arrow. This is conjugation in action. Um, this is a bacteria here, bacteria here. That's the pili joining the pili, forming that conjugation tube where the copy of the plasmid would be exchanged from one bacteria to another. That's the bottom one. No big deal. We've done that one already. Okay, the top two, this one and this one, are a little bit different. Transduction is genetic recombination between a bacteria and a virus. It's when a virus can inject genetic material into a bacteria. Remember, these are called bacteriophages, bacteriophage. So if a bacteriophage injects its genetic material into a bacteria and the bacteria uptakes that genetic material, this bacteria is now genetically varied. So it's a type of reproduction, not that the bacteria is in charge of it, the virus is the one that injected the gene genetic material, but if the bacteria uptakes that, it's known as transduction and it's a form of genetic recombination. Now we've talked in this class already about how humans have utilized this process to generate like insulin. So we can take a virus as a vector, put a human gene inside of it that codes for insulin production, let them attack that bacteria. Now the bacteria has the human gene that codes for insulin production, and that was a form of transduction, even though the bacteria isn't the one that initiated the, the sexual reproduction, but now that's considered genetic recombination or variation due to the exchange of genetic info. Okay, this last one, transformation, I'm going to show you a picture in just a second. This is when a bacteria can actually uptake, uptake DNA from a dead, from a dead bacteria. So you can have a bacteria that's in the environment where there are dead bacteria that have broken down and this ba dead bacteria's genetic information can be taken up by the live bacteria. That was actually discovered, um, you know, when scientists were trying to discover DNA, uh, scientists stumbled upon this idea of transformation. And so I'm going to show you in just a second um, a picture of that. Kind of cool, huh? All right, so here we go. Um, this is the experiment that was done by Griffith. I don't know if you guys remember freshman year, we talked about Griffith, and he was trying to create a vaccine for pneumococcus uh, bacterial infection. He just kind of like stumbled upon this idea of transformation. Um, so the definition, if you're going to highlight, the definition of this, and here's my little highlighter, is when external DNA is incorporated into these bacterial cells and it can come from a dead bacteria. So here's how this experiment worked. It's kind of cool. Um, there were two strains of uh, pneumococcal bacteria. So in this picture right here, the, I, I don't know, we'll call them turquoise or little blue uh, bacteria. These are bacteria right here that are virulent. That means disease causing. So when Griffith did this experiment, he took these bacteria, okay, these little uh, greenish blue ones, he put them in a syringe, made a serum out of it, injected them into mice for experimental purposes, and all the mice died. So he knew that these bacteria of this variety, which, by the way, they called them smooth, the S is for smooth, these smooth bacteria, which were virulent, killed mice whenever they were injected into them. So they were like, oh, these are bad, these are virulent. Okay, and remember, they're trying to, they were trying to create a vaccine when they stumbled upon this process. So in the second scenario, Okay, they took a sample of our bacteria. This one is non-virulent. You probably already know what's going to happen if you take non-virulent bacteria. These are the red ones. Put them in the serum, in the shot, injected the mice, and the mice live. It's like, yay, they're not disease-causing. The mice are okay. In the third scenario, Griffith said, you know, I wonder if you take these bacteria over here that we know are virulent 
We heat kill them. That means let's increase their temperature, denature everything on the inside. So the shape now you see is like little bitty squiggle lines. They're all squiggled up. Let's heat kill them. Let's put them in the shot, inject them into the mice, and lo and behold, the mice lived. So that was kind of his, his trigger that, oh, maybe we could make some sort of vaccine or some sort of, you know, something to help fight off pneumococcal bacteria if we use this idea that we can heat kill these bacteria. So the interesting thing came along in the next scenario where he took the red R bacteria that were non-virulent, look, non-virulent, which are supposed to be, yay, happy face, the mice lives, the, the mice live, he took these heat killed S ones, these over here that were heat killed, which made the mouse live, so it should be a happy face, happy, happy. Lo and behold, when he put these two together into the shot, injected them into the mice, the mice died. And Griffith was like, what in the heck is going on? This was not supposed to happen with these two bacteria types, the heat killed S, okay, that's this one, heat killed S, the normal smooth, which is non-virulent, this should have made this mouse live, and it didn't happen. So then what happened? Of course, they did a bunch of little autopsies. Can you imagine these little mice cutting them open and doing autopsies? But they did little mouse autopsies, and when they looked at the tissue inside the mice, here's what they discovered. In the dead mice, there were alive and kicking bad bacteria that were of this S variety, alive and virulent, and that's what caused the mouse to die. So, of course, you're like, well, what happened? That's bizarre. That's crazy. Well, now we know this process of transformation happened. Transformation. So over here in this picture, these heat-killed S bacteria, these blue ones, they were heat-killed, but their DNA was uptaken by the non-virulent um, little red ones, the R ones. The DNA was taken up. And those became, they turned into, the word is transformed, they transformed into now pathogenic or virulent bacteria. Isn't that crazy? So it's a form of genetic variation that is pretty interesting, and we're going to study it more as we go throughout this year. Okay, here's a closer look at transduction. Um, this one, like I said earlier, is transfer of genes between a bacteria and a virus vector. So you can see here's your bacteriophage. There he is right there. He lands on the outside. There's his genetic material. It goes in. It goes up to the DNA of the bacteria. And eventually, that bacteria now has, right here, by the time it's done, there is a piece of viral genetic material incorporated into that transduced cell. So that's another form of genetic variation. Okay, the last one, and I think I've been over this, so I don't really have to spend a lot of time. I've already talked about this twice in this recording. Um, this is just a closer look at conjugation. And it is sexual repro, where there's a direct transfer of a plasmid from one bacteria to another through that pili, which makes, like I told you guys, a conjugation tube. And there's your formal definition of a plasmid. Small ring of DNA normally functions in antibiotic resistance or better metabolism and it replicates independently of the entire DNA. Okay, so we've been over that one already. All right, we are almost done. Hang in there. If I'm not mistaken, I believe this is our last slide. Let's double check. Uh, yes, because I can do that one in class. So we are amazing. Here we go. Okie dokie. Okay, so the next slide is about metabolism. And there are a few objective questions that you have that focus on metabolism. So make sure you're awake and you're paying attention. Don't get tired on me now. Um, remember, we are AP bio students and we are gunning for that AP test. So we want to make sure we do a good job on this. All right, so prokaryotic organisms um, have amazing, uh, great metabolic abilities. So one type of metabolism that is found in some bacteria is they can be nitrogen fixers, nitrogen fixation. Um, it's a great process where they can uh, use nitrogen, where nitrogen can be used to synthesize amino acids and other organic molecules. So I'm going to write that down right here. Nitrogen can be used, can be used to synthesize, can't even spell, synthesize 
amino acids, I'm just going to abbreviate AA, and other organic molecules. Okay, so nitrogen can be used to synthesize amino acids and other organic molecules. You probably remember, remember from freshman year that like um, proteins have N in them. Remember chon, sometimes sulfur, and then uh, nucleic acids have chomp, which has a nitrogen in it. So nitrogen is really important for bacteria. They need it to be able to produce their proteins and their nucleic acids. So some bacteria have this ability to fix nitrogen. Um, one example is cyanobacteria cyanobacteria, which are actually photosynthetic, which is where you see that cyan from. They're like a blue-green color. They are a type of U bacteria who uses uh, nitrogen fixation. But kingdom archaebacteria, archaebacteria also has methanogens, methanogens, which can fix nitrogen as well. So both kingdoms, U bacteria and archaeobacteria, have members that can, are capable of nitrogen fixation. The methanogens that are in archaeobacteria and then the cyanobacteria, which are also photosynthetic, in kingdom U bacteria. So they can take, their, the way that they do this is they take atmospheric nitrogen and they can convert it to an ammonium ion, which can then be converted in some other pathways that makes it usable for them to make their amino acids and to make other types of organic molecules. So it's kind of a cool thing. Um, the biofilm that we mentioned earlier in the notes uh, is a type of metabolic cooperation that's considered uh, metabolic cooperation among them because they're cooperating with each other uh, whenever they trap those cells and use them uh, for food source, uh, heterotrophic means. Um, then, of course, we can't leave out the oxygen relationships. Okay, we have to talk about these oxygen relationships. So I'm sure you're, you might be assuming that because bacteria are alive that all of them have to use oxygen, but that's not the case, as you can see, by the three categories of bacteria. Some of them are, look at the word, obligate, which sounds like obligated, right? Obligated means have to. And aerobe sounds like air, which is oxygen. So if you translate that into common words, these are bacteria that must use oxygen, have to use oxygen, so I'll put use right here, have to use oxygen for cellular respiration. So to get their ATP through cell respiration, they have to have oxygen present to do that. They cannot grow without it. Okay, there's another category called facultative anaerobes. Look at that an means not or without, right? Facultative anaerobes, they will use oxygen if it's present, will use oxygen if it's present, but can also carry out Fermentation. Do you guys remember fermentation? Fermentation is an anaerobic process. And if you remember, um, we talked about like lactic acid fermentation and alcoholic fermentation. So these are called facultative anaerobes if they can use oxygen if it's present, but then can also carry out fermentation or anaerobic respiration if they're in an anaerobic environment. Perfect example for this one, I'm sure you've heard of this. If you eat yogurt, you definitely have. Um, there's a bacteria called lactobacillus. So lacto is because it's found in dairy products. That's the lactose sugar. And bacillus is its rod shape. So they are definitely facultative anaerobes. If you take the lid off that yogurt, they can utilize the oxygen for cell respiration. But then if you put the lid on them, they switch over to anaerobic means um, and can go through fermentation or anaerobic respiration in order to produce their ATP. Okay, the third category, this still has the word obligate, which means have to, but we put an in front of that word aerobic. So they are truly poisoned. This is the word that is used here. They are poisoned by oxygen. So some will exclusively live by fermentation, by fermentation only. So fermentation only, others can extract chemical energy by anaerobic respiration in which substances other than oxygen, such as like sulfate or nitrite, nitrate ions, and they can accept an electron in the electron transport chain. So these are obligated to not have oxygen and will to be poisoned if you put them in an oxygen environment. Okay, so those are some examples of metabolic abilities. Okay, our second to last slide, we are almost done. We're going to go ahead and knock this out now. We might as well do it now, and then when you come to class, we can start with Protista. So I'm going to go ahead and go through. This is called uh, Cook's Postulates. 
Okay, I don't know, some of you might call it cock, but it's cook. Okay. This is uh, bacterial parthenogenesis. It's Cook's postulates, which are four criteria that are designed to establish a causal relationship between a causative microbe and a disease. So it was really used for bacterial disease confirmation. Um, it was developed in 1884, and it was refined and published in 1890. So we're talking about a long time ago, 1884, 1890 is when Cook's postulates were published, and they're still used today. That's what tells you how um, ac accurate these are. So what it does is it uses um, a series of criteria, four different criteria, uh, to try to establish the cause of disease. Um, it was really used in the 1890s uh, for cholera and tuberculosis. So cholera and TB are both bacterial, but have also been uh, generally used to use uh, to, for other diseases. So what are the criteria? Um, one of the criteria for Cook's postulates is the microorganism is found in all individuals with the disease. So let's say you had a group of people that you were looking at. Let's say a group of people had this disease and you're trying to figure out what it is. If you can find that organism in all of the diseased people, then that's one of the criteria for trying to identify its mode of attack and, and what it is. Um, if the microorganism can be cultured from a host, so you go to individual people that have it, you culture it in a laboratory, then that could be a positive identification. Okay, if the isolated organism can produce the disease if it's injected into another host, okay, that's a way to positively identify. And then, of course, the fourth criteria, because you have to be able to do all of these, is then the organism can be isolated from that newly infected host. So let's say you have a group of people that show the disease. You find it in all of them. You then are going to culture it. So you take a sample from all the organisms and try to grow it in a Petri dish in the laboratory. Then you're going to take a sample of that and inject it into healthy individuals. And then from there, if you can isolate that same uh, disease in the newly infected host, then you can possibly identify this and name whatever the bacteria is. Okay, so um, Cook's postulates are used quite a bit um, as long as the infected host is identified as it was identical to the original, then, then you're good to go, okay? All right, last two little bullets here. Some bacteria are opportunistic pathogens, which means that they're normal residents of a host, but yet if that defense system, like the immune system, is weakened in the individual, then they could become pathogenic to that person. I'll give you a perfect example. Most of us have E. coli in our intestines, and it's non-pathogenic and everything's fine, but there are cases when that can mutate and change, and if your defense system is weakened, then that can become pathogenic at that point. So, um, you know, these are opportunistic pathogens is what we call them when they're normal residents uh, of the host, but then when, you know, the host's defense mechanisms are weakened, that they could turn to become pathogenic. So the word that we use is opportunistic. Okay, last little bullet um, is talking about toxin production. A toxin is a poison. So it could be an exotoxin or an endotoxin. Exo means outside, endo means inside. So an exotoxin is a bacterial protein that can produce a disease without the prokaryote being present. This is scary. This means you could have a bacteria that enters your body, delivers its exotoxin, its poison. It's no longer in your body, but you still have the poison present and can make you sick, such as botulism or cholera. Botulism is caused by an exotoxin released from Clostridium botulinum, and I'm sure you've heard of Botox because uh, scientists take that same exotoxin and water it down and inject it into people's faces to try to prevent wrinkles, etc. So dermatologists have used that. But it is a powerful exotoxin that honestly, all uh, botulism, the exotoxin that causes that, it can cause paralysis. That's why it is well used for dermatologists because it paralyzes the muscles that cause laugh lines and wrinkle lines, but it's a very powerful exotoxin that goes straight to the nervous system. Okay, endotoxins are inside. These are components of a gram-negative membrane. Okay, so if you have that gram-negative membrane, that uh, lipopolysaccharide membrane, this could secrete an endotoxin, which might be salmonella food poisoning, could be typhoid fever. So this one is inside 
uh, the bacteria, and then it's also inside the body. So you would need the bacteria present to have this one transmitted, but on the other one, it's just a toxin formation. And then I believe the last slide, that just shows you a picture of the lipopolysaccharide membrane. No big deal. Um, and then this is it right here. We're going to finish it up. The last slide, I just gave you some examples of some uh, bacterial diseases that I'm sure you've heard of. Like you heard me say Clostridium botulinum. SP means species. So there's more than botulinum. There's other ones. Uh, Staphylococcus, and by the way, these are genus names. That's a genus, 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 genus. And then this is generic for a species. This is a specific species. This is a specific species. There is no species here. There is no species here. So there are different ones. So what I thought would be interesting is if maybe you looked up some bacterial parthenogenesis and looked up some of these diseases, um, like this one can cause gonorrhea. Uh, this one I'm sure you've heard of strep throat, but there's also streptococcus pneumoniae. Um, you've heard of staph infections, but there's different species of that. And then this one um, can cause food poisoning, et cetera. So I thought this would be an interesting area for you guys to do some research and look up some of these and find out a little bit about them and see if you've ever heard of any of them and some gross things that they do to the body. So that concludes our bacteria. Way to go, guys. Way to pay attention. I'm glad you're still awake. <laughs>